Hi, my name is Dr. Kelsey Thompson, and I currently serve as a general dentist at a community health center in Detroit, Michigan. I was introduced to CMDA during my first week of dental school, and it has been an instrumental part of my life ever since. My dental school CMDA chapter helped to provide the encouragement and mentorship that was crucial to my spiritual growth and development throughout those four years. Following graduation, God led me to join the CMDA plus dental residency program in Memphis, Tennessee. My three years in this program provided me with invaluable experiences in learning to share the love of Jesus, from living among and serving marginalized communities in inner city Memphis, to providing dental care in a straw hut in the middle of the Saharan desert. My eyes were open to the unique ways that dentistry and medicine can be utilized to further the kingdom of God in our everyday practice, as well as to the ends of the earth. In addition to these amazing experiences, the CMDA plus dental residency has provided me with continual mentorship, as well as an irreplaceable community of believers and lifelong friends to support me, not only through the ups and downs of clinical practice, but in every other aspect of life as well. I am truly grateful for the ways I have been challenged and discipled in my professional and spiritual journey by this community, and I look forward to the ways I can now do the same for other young professionals coming behind me. Thanks for having me today. Well, I want to welcome you to the one-year anniversary of CMDA Matters, a weekly podcast of the Christian Medical and Dental Associations. I'm your host, Dr. Mike Chupp, and today, as we bridge from the old year 2020 to the new year 2021, I wanted to focus on member well-being by sharing with you an interview that was released earlier this year on the CMDA Healthy Doctor podcast, hosted by our very own Dr. Steve Sartori, the director of our Center for Well-Being. Steve is a certified physician coach who helps doctors and other healthcare professionals align with God, optimize well-being, and maximize their influence. He's a graduate of the Medical College of Wisconsin. He has been CEO of a private practice group, chief of staff at two different hospitals, a faculty member for a family medicine residency program, and chief medical officer for a faith-based community health center. He's served CMDA in the past as a board member and our treasurer, and has participated in mission trips to Jamaica, Thailand, Romania, Kenya, and Eswatini. He is married with two adult children and two grandsons and enjoys traveling and sports. In fact, he's a very avid fan of that football team from the Great White North who are having another fantastic season, the Green Bay Packers. He actually can sometimes be seen wearing a cheese head. Dr. Sartori will be introducing his guest today, Dr. Omira Mansfield and their conversation is a focus on transformative trust. Let's get right to that conversation. Welcome to the Healthy Doctor Podcast, where we host conversations about physician well-being. I'm Dr. Steve Sartori, Director of the Center for Well-Being at the Christian Medical and Dental Associations. Our topic of discussion today is trust. Trust is foundational for healthy relationships, healthy teams, and healthy organizations, and the erosion of trust is one of the drivers of burnout among healthcare professionals. Thankfully, building trust is a skill that can be cultivated, and my guest on this episode, Dr. Omira Mansfield, will help us explore this topic in more detail. Dr. Mansfield is an emergency medicine physician and chief of staff at Advent Health Celebration and also a proud graduate of the Advent Health Physician Leadership and REACH Leadership courses. She co-authored The Trust Transformation, a workshop that helps participants transform and improve the relationships in their lives by building a foundation of trust. Her primary areas of interest are improving the physician and patient experience as it relates to improving provider well-being patient adherence to care and clinical outcomes, 
and she has lectured extensively on these topics. She is married to Frederick, a pediatric anesthesiologist, and together they enjoy the adventure that is raising their daughter Elizabeth and son Alexander, who regularly remind them to savor the little joys in life. They stay healthy doing CrossFit and running together. I'm looking forward to learning more about trust, and I hope you are too. Omira, thank you for joining me on this episode of the Healthy Doctor podcast. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I've been reading uh, some of the content of a book you've co-authored, and it's been very interesting, The Trust Transformation. So as I was reading, I'm always interested in who the authors are, and then I had a chance to meet you personally. And how did you get interested in this topic of trust? I had the privilege of being introduced to my co-author, Roy Reed, um, by actually someone by the name of Todd Chobitar, who is the head of Advent Health Publishing. Uh, we had taken a class together, and he was really fascinated with this concept of where trust is or is not working in our lives, in our relationships. Roy was going to start working on this project, and we were looking for a clinician to collaborate with. And I work in the emergency department, and it really is a place where when you think about it, we are responsible for trying to establish a relationship built on trust, sometimes within seconds or minutes in our world. And I really start to think about how does that influence how I take care of patients and when this opportunity to work on this project and put out this book and this workshop for our employees and, and for others, I really just I couldn't pass it up. And it's been interesting to see how working on this project has actually really influenced how I approach relationships now and really focused on making sure that they're built on a strong foundation of trust. People use this word trust, but we use it in various ways. So I'm wondering, when you look at that word, what does it really mean? That's a good question. I don't think many of us stop to think about the actual definition. I think it's a word that's t tossed around. And we probably take it for granted until trust is lost. So when you think about the actual definition of trust, we characterize that as an assured reliance on the character, ability, strength of someone, or the truth of someone or something. But what does that really mean? And it really comes down to the fact that there's this inherent belief of consistency, authenticity, dependability, that again, it's, it's amazing to pass stop thinking about it when it's present, but when it's lost is when we really start to appreciate it more. Like many things, it comes to your attention when you don't have it, and you assume it when you do have it oftentimes. Exactly, exactly. Well, what makes this trust so important in our lives as clinicians? Well, it's important in our lives as clinicians, but I would even take a step back and say it's even more important in our personal lives. We look at trust as first starting within ourselves. I would argue that it's almost impossible to develop a relationship built on trust with another person, much less another team, or in our world, another patient, if we don't have trust within ourselves. We truly have to understand that we first start with ourselves, the person within, and determine whether we actually consider ourselves a trustworthy individual. And in doing so, by knowing that we have that inherent faith in ourselves, then we can extend that trust to others and then hope that they will extend that trust with us. When we think about what that means with the care that we provide our patients, how can we possibly ask someone to put their lives in our hands or in the hands of our team if the trust is not there? So it's really an inside job first. We must learn to trust ourselves before we can sort of demonstrate it and let it get outside of us. Exactly. We start with the me, then we work on the we, and only then can we work on the us. You know, that's probably the most difficult piece. I can only imagine how much we doubt ourselves oftentimes. And people think doctors are so confident and competent, and yet so many doctors report in privacy that they don't really believe in themselves. Absolutely. And I think that's probably probably part of where we're struggling as a profession. I mean, it, all you have to do is turn on the news these days to see where we have this uh, issue with physician well-being. Certainly when it's an, it's an extreme, we see that in the form of physician depression or physician suicide. But even without getting to that extreme, so many of us every day struggle with that ability to practice in a way that it really allows us to be true to ourselves. 
I think sometimes it's because we've been taught sometimes, you know, fake it until you make it. But in reality, we none of us want to be living our lives that way. We want to really be true in our authentic selves. Mm-hmm. And so when we think about having that trustworthiness within ourselves, we think about these characteristics that we know we need to work on in ourselves. And at the heart of those are these concepts of having these characteristics where we live with integrity and we approach every day with a good attitude. And that is where we start the journey on becoming a trustworthy individual. So when doctors come to your course and they say, well, how do I get started with this? I'm having a difficult time uh, with these sorts of attributes or characteristics or trusting myself. What do you have to offer them? Well, the first step is to talk about humility and understand that none of us have it right. Even those of us who are teaching this every day and preaching this every day, we wouldn't even pretend to say that we have it all right. But step one is having a general awareness that all of us can do better and that we have to own it. I would say that when I talk to physicians, and it's always such a privilege to be able to speak to my colleagues about this, I just encourage them to say, be open to it and understand that it's worth the time and effort And you will immediately start to see the changes in yourself. And it's even more fascinating when others around you will start to see the effort that you're making and how they respond to it, most commonly in a very positive way. So I argue to them, say, hey, be humble, start with humility, and just own this process. So there's hope to develop this and build this and grow this, but uh, humility is really a starting point. Yes, absolutely. That's great to hear that we can grow that and build that, and yet sometimes I'm sure we shoot ourselves in the foot, so to speak, and we uh, do things that really erode trust. So what are some of the things we might do that would work against us? You know, there's a number of things, and sometimes I think we're afraid to even call ourselves on it. Just to give a few examples, well, the most important thing, the most important foundational aspect of trust, I would say, is integrity. And integrity is this concept of a firm adherence to a moral set of standards or values. Really, it's being that person that you say you are all the time, always speaking the truth no matter what. When that is lacking, that's probably the first place that we can easily identify where distrust is generated by not being consistently honest no matter what the consequences might be. Other ways that we see people break trust is by not being dependable, not being reliable, not being where you're going to be when you say you're going to be there, or not being or doing what you say you're going to do consistently. Other ways would be not being authentic. When people question who are they going to get on a certain day, and in many times that really comes down to the attitude that people can expect from you. Is it the concept of having the physician who is Dr. Jekyll or Mr. Hyde? We want someone who's going to be a consistent character where our staff, our team, our patients, or even more importantly, our family and friends know who they're going to get all the time. We want to know that we're being basically our best person every moment as consistently as possible. And then when we do err, which we will because we're human, understanding that we need to ask for forgiveness and then also forgive ourselves. I'm glad you addressed that because I was thinking, well, what do we need to do or what can we do when we breach those things that build trust? You mentioned character and integrity and responsibility and dependability. And and yet, as we know, we stumble, we trip, we fall. None of us has arrived. We humbly embrace the fact that that is the case and we ask for forgiveness. And then we go about rebuilding. Exactly. And and with trust and with this concept of being an authentic person, part of authenticity is having candor. And that should be expected of us and we should expect that of others. We should expect others to be willing to help us identify our blind spots so that we can become better people. But with that, we have to understand that there will be forgiveness and there, there will be apologies. And when we forgive, not only should we ask to be forgiven, but I would say that when we are willing to forgive others, others are willing to extend us a little bit more peace, a little bit more space, a little bit more opportunity to err because they recognize that we will also be seeking for forgiveness. Well, when you begin to talk about these character issues and forgiveness and humility, there's certainly something that speaks to the spiritual nature 
of who we are and how we are made. So my next question would be, then how does religious faith actually impact trust? Our idea with the trust transformation is that faith is the highest manifestation of trust. And actually, if you look at the Oxford English Dictionary definition of faith, it actually defines it as the complete trust or confidence in someone or something. It's, it's interesting, though, because I, I've been a Christian all my life, but I'd never actually thought about what faith actually meant. And in the end, it really is this belief that I have full trust in God. It's really interesting. I wonder how many Christians have actually stopped to think about that. I might be behind the times, and I'll call myself out for that. But once I came to realize that really it comes down to having trust, that also means that I can be at peace. Yeah, so how does trust, uh, if, if people are people of trust and they engage with other people of trust that have a high trust quotient or whatever you call it, how does that then affect the results of what we do? How does it affect performance? How does it affect, you know, an organization is interested in how work happens, how we take care of patients? What's the impact? Oh, it's remarkable. And, and there are countless studies that have been out there demonstrating the positive effects of trust. Let's start with the person, because I think that's really at the core. We want our people to really be better people. People with high trust relationships actually have lower rates of depression, anxiety. Those who have chronic illness, for example, with cancer, they actually have lower reported rates of pain. People in high trust relationships, for the example, those who demonstrate gratitude regularly, which is something that we uh, highly encourage, they have lower blood pressure. Those who are diabetics have lower hemoglobin A1Cs. They report general rates of happiness that are higher than the general population. They actually live longer and are less likely to get sick. I mean, that's really fascinating on a personal level that you can see these manifestations from a mental health perspective, from a physical health perspective. And actually, people who have higher trusting relationships actually have a greater sense of fulfillment in their lives than if they earned 50% more at work. Then you extend that to an employee or a population of people working together in an organization. High trust organizations have greater rates of retention. They have greater loyalty from not only their employees, but from their customers. This has been demonstrated a few times and actually been published in the Harvard Business Review. High trust uh, organizations report generally higher rates of job satisfaction and greater cooperation amongst employees. And what's really exciting for me is that just in a 2016 paper, it demonstrated that in the healthcare environment, there was a greater rate of cooperation amongst employees when trust was present. To me, it's arguably one of the best investments that a company can make is to really start at the core and work on trust and develop that in an organization because the benefits are just extraordinary. Well, certainly we as individuals, if we cultivate those high trust relationships, it sounds like it's beneficial for our health and our well-being. And organizationally, if I'm a leader of a healthcare organization, I want healthy employees and uh, healthy working relationships. So cultivating the kind of curriculum that you have created, I can see why it's so popular uh, and why it's so needed. Absolutely. I mean, think about what we ask of people when they come to us in a healthcare setting, right? And to your point, you want your physician to look relatively healthy, to seem like they get along with their team. And we really try to promote that. But starting at the core of really focusing on how do we build those relationships on the strongest foundation of trust possible, that's what we've been doing. And to see the manifestation of that, it's been such a privilege to be a part of it. I think several books have espoused the principle that a foundation of trust is a singular advantage for high-performing teams, high-performing organizations, and high-performing individuals. So the criticality and the importance of it cannot be underestimated. It cannot be overestimated at all. It's, it's just powerful. It is. It really is. Yeah. You've done a great job of sort of giving us the bullet points and the keys to these trust principles. And I really appreciate that. Is there anything else you would like to share uh, about this issue or this topic? I would say that if, if you haven't taken an opportunity to really stop and think about it, 
and yet you're faced every day with the stressors that we face in our work environment. And that's in healthcare and also in every other work environment that there is. Or if you're dealing with a situation at home or maybe with friends or extended family, something that's very difficult. And I, I'll often characterize it for people to say, sometimes you just know when something's not right because you feel it viscerally. It's like that sense in your stomach that something's just not right. When you really break it down to its core, oftentimes what I have found, when people feel that in a particular relationship or in a particular situation, oftentimes it's a lack of trust that's at the heart of the matter. And it's identifying what can we do to remedy the situation. Now, this will not always fix it, but there is something to be said for that sense of ownership that gives you a sense of relief that you are doing something about it. Oftentimes, I think helplessness is a state that most of us don't want to live in. And by owning relationships, by doing what you can to try to remedy when trust has been broken, it's remarkable what it can do to someone's mental health, to their self-esteem, to their confidence going forward. And then the next time that they deal with a difficult situation, and again, that's either at home or at work in the community, it becomes that much easier. So I would say everyone deserves an opportunity to really focus on themselves, to find where they can do better, and and something as simple as identifying what they can do to become a more trustworthy individual is a great place to start. Well, you're describing a sense of courage to accept responsibility, to accept ownership, to realize we have choices we can make, we have agency, we are not helpless, we are not powerless, but we can make change. Exactly. You know, we talk about there are four attributes of trust, trustworthiness, authenticity, dependability, and ultimately the largest manifestation of obtaining that trust is using your influence. And so we would say that the key goals that we want everyone to do are to take responsibility for your relationships, build trust from the inside out, keep your word and communicate consistently, and finally be a good steward of your trust. And if you approach your situations with that in mind, I promise you'll sleep better, you'll probably feel healthier, and others will learn a lot from you. It sounds like it's a prescription for well-being. So thank you for sharing all of that. And thank you so much for joining me today on this episode of the Healthy Doctor Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Well, that final comment uh, by Dr. Mansfield got me thinking. She said we need to show good stewardship for the trust that we've been given. And it reminded me of a comment that one of our past trustees made to me at the CMDA National Convention when I was commissioned in May of 2019. He said to me, Mike, do you realize that you have inherited an incredible legacy of trust capital? because of those who've led before you. And I can tell you that I have thought about that comment so many times since I became the CEO. Being a good steward of the trust that we've been given by patients, by our family, by our church and community. I hope you were challenged by that year-end, year-beginning podcast as much as I was. You know, CMDA has curated many great resources for well-being. You can learn all about life and leadership coaching for healthcare professionals by just going to cmda.org slash coaching. While you're there, you might consider registering for the 501 Foundations for Christian Coaching online seminar, which begins February 1st. I personally had decided to bite the bullet and I signed up for this course after being blessed by Dr. Sartori and Pastor Ken Jones at the Give Back Tuesday webinar on restoring your strength in early December. I did not want to put off that training any longer. I understand that there are still a few spots left. So would you consider registering today? (music) 
Dr. Sartori recommends some additional books that he wanted me to mention today. And the first is The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry by John Mark Comer. It's been described as a remedy for our overworked and tired souls. If there ever was a time when healthcare professionals were overworked and burnt out, a pandemic certainly is that time. You can find this book on Amazon and it will be linked in the show notes. Being present in the moment is essential for finding joy and meaning in life. The little book, If I Should Die Before I Live, by our own Pastor Ken Jones, whom I just mentioned, teaches us how to navigate someday, any day, maybe now, every day, yesterday, today, tomorrow, and a day of rest, finding more peace and meaning in our fast-paced lives. Be sure to find this book also on Amazon. I bet that one of your New Year's resolutions is to have less stress and more peace in 2021. The book Reset, Living a Grace-Paced Life in a Burnout Culture by David Murray can help. You can find this book and many others at cmda.org slash store or call and order at 888-230-2637. The Healthy Doctor podcast, which comes out on a monthly basis, is all about equipping healthcare professionals to care for themselves as they care for others. The CMDA Center for Wellbeing has a lot of great resources to help healthcare professionals do just that. You can access the Healthy Doctor podcast and much more by going to cmda.org slash wellbeing. You know, this is the final week for you to register for our first ever multiple site live and virtual healthcare missions conference that we call Remedy, Bringing the Hope and Healing of Christ to a World in Crisis. That conference is being held Saturday and Sunday, January 9th and 10th. At CMDA, our passion is that Christians in healthcare be prepared when this pandemic is over to serve both short-term and long-term in numbers greater than we have ever seen before and in places that still have not yet had the opportunity to hear the message of hope of the cross of Christ. Start the new year off right with inspiring lectures from notable speakers and Christian leaders in healthcare including Reverend Steve Noblet from Memphis, who's the executive director of the Christian Community Health Fellowship. Also, Dr. David Kim, who's director of Beacon Christian Community Health Center in New York City. I'll also be sharing from CMDA National Ministry in Bristol, Tennessee. And then Dr. Rebecca Meyer, who's professor of nursing at California Baptist University. We believe this will be a great blessing to so many. So please don't miss out on your chance to register even today by just going to cmda.org slash remedy. You know, after that great conversation today between Dr. Sartori and Dr. Mansfield on the topic of transformative trust, I wanted to close this program, Bridging 2020 and 2021, with a familiar set of verses in Proverbs from the New International Version that so powerfully challenge us to place trust in the one who made us. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 through 8. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. The CMDA Center for Wellbeing is all about helping you align with God's purposes for your life, optimize your well-being, 
and maximize your influence in every aspect of your life. I believe that those things have mattered to you all throughout 2020, and they will also matter to you in 2021. And what matters to you in the past year and in the coming year matters to CMDA and CMDA matters. We will see you in 2021, God willing. This podcast has been a production of the Christian Medical and Dental Associations. The opinions expressed by guests on this podcast are not necessarily endorsed by the Christian Medical and Dental Associations. CMDA is a nonpartisan organization that does not endorse political parties or candidates for public office. The views expressed on this podcast reflect judgments regarding principles and values held by CMDA and its members and are not intended to imply endorsement of any political party or candidate.